You may be seated. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 16 and 17. Hear now these words. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out and teaches us to do what is right. It is God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipped for, the very, for every good thing God wants us to do. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Excuse me, let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This is the second in our sermon series, Questions We Ask God. And if you ask me, is the Bible reliable? Quite a doozy of a question. I have been wrestling with this all week, trying to figure out how to present it. Uh, but in reality, I've been wrestling with questions like this for years um, and probably will continue to. I don't know, but you may have wrestled with questions about the Bible also. And that's not a bad thing. Sometimes it can get a bad rap, but it's not a bad thing. Because when we wrestle with something, it means that we are engaged with it. It's important enough for us to care about and want to struggle with. So if something I say today or something that you've been thinking about causes questions for you, I would love for you to reach out and have a conversation um, because that's where we grow. So let me just start out by saying that I love the Bible. I have read through the entire Bible numerous times. And I spend time in it every week, personally in devotional time, um, preparing for sermons sometimes, and getting ready to lead small groups like our Disciple Bible Study, which is ongoing currently. I couldn't live well without the Bible because the more I read and study it, the more I get to know God. But the question before us today isn't whether we like the Bible or even whether we read it. It's do we find it reliable? Now, when we think about whether the Bible is reliable, we need to determine what we mean by that. There are lots of ways that we can assess the Bible's reliability because the Bible can be used in many different ways. But before we talk about its reliability, Let's just make sure we have some facts about the Bible so that we're all on the same page. The Bible, while it is bound together in one volume, is actually a library of 66 books. And it's only since the invention of the printing press that it was in one place. Usually there were different scrolls or pieces of the Bible. This book, or all these books, were written by different authors over a span of over a thousand years. As our passage from 2 Timothy pointed out, these books were written by people who were inspired by their encounters with God. But they were just regular people, just like all of us. They were situated in a particular place and time. While they had divine inspiration, they were limited by their time and the language that they could use to describe God and their history with God. Many times, they were trying to describe the inherently indescribable God. That's a tall order. So one of the things they did was talk about God in human terms which makes God easier to visualize and for us to identify with, but it limits God because God is far more than a human being. 
In addition, these books in the Bible aren't all alike. They encompass many different genres. Sometimes a whole book is a certain genre, like the book of Psalms is all poetry. Other times, there are shifts within a given book, from history to poetry to letter to apocalypse to myth to parable and back again. And they're not all in one book, but all these books can have multiple genres within them. So we need to know what we're reading. We can get all messed up if we are reading a parable or a myth and treat it as factual history. Of course, the Bible is a very com important component of our faith. We United Methodists, however, know that scripture is just one part of what we use for theological reflection. John Wesley believed that there were four principal factors, what we now know as the, or call the quadrilateral, that inform the core of our Christian faith. As Becky said last week, they are scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. In other words, when we read scripture, we don't stop there. We look to church tradition, our faith experience, and our reason to evaluate what we have read. Thus, we do not take the creation story in Genesis 1 that says that the world was created in six days and God rested on the seventh as literally true. If we did that, we would be put in the difficult position of having to ignore verifiable scientific facts. If you take the six days of creation as our starting point and do the math, that says that the earth is only 6,000 years old. However, according to the National Geographic Society, we have scientific proof that it is over four and a half billion years old. That's quite a disconnect. <laughs> Thus, we understand that this account of creation is a myth. And while it might not be factually true, it contains essential truths. The, this myth, <clears throat> excuse me, this myth enables us to learn some very important things about God. A few of them are that God is the creator of everything, that God can create order out of chaos, and that God create everything in creation is good, and that all of creation together is very good. And those are important things to hold on to. So is the Bible reliable as a source, a source of scientific knowledge? No. However, that statement in no way lessens the importance of the Bible. The authors who wrote these books weren't trying to write a scientifically sound and provable text. They didn't have the capability of knowing what we know today. Their goal was to present a record of God's actions and God's nature so that we might get to know God. Just as the Bible isn't a reliable scientific book, it isn't always a reliable history book according to our modern way of thinking. The authors didn't seek to include all information like we try to with our history today. They just included what they thought was important for the story that they were telling. In addition, these ancient texts a lot of them were put together based on different sources so that there can be some internal inconsistencies within a book. For example, the book of 1 Samuel. Um, in chapter 16, David is serving in Saul's court, playing the harp for Saul. But when we just turn the page, and in chapter 17, David is fighting Goliath, and Saul asks who he is and wants to find out about him. 
pretty inconsistent. But that's because there were two different sources that the author thought was important to include both stories. So if the Bible isn't totally reliable as a science book or a history book, what about it being a rule book, which is how a lot of people want to use it? Brian McLaurin, in his book, A New Kind of Christianity, asserts that many people want to read the Bible like a constitution that gives us all-encompassing, unchangeable rules for right and wrong. But viewing the Bible like a constitution once again tries to make the Bible into something it was never intended to be. The Bible was written thousands of years ago and addresses issues relevant for that particular time and place. It was written in context. The author, authors never intended all parts of it to be construed as eternally binding law. For instance, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians has been used to say that women should not be in leadership in a church. Even though that piece of advice was meant to deal with particular things that were going on in that church in Corinth, it was a letter. Paul wasn't writing a law. He never intended it to be used as a universal mandate because if we read all of Paul's writings, we see that Paul worked closely with women and they were in important positions. So as, is, as in this case, when people use the Bible as a rule book, they generally lift out particular verses to prove that the Bible either condemns or condones certain actions, but they don't look at the full context. While there are eternal truths in the Bible, definitely, they generally are more, more far-reaching than just what is gleaned in one or two verses taken out of context. Taking verses out of contact, context actually allows the Bible to be used to justify things that we now find morally indefensible. For instance, in the 1800s, people in the United States used biblical passages such as, it is from the nations around you that you may acquire male and female slaves. That's out of Leviticus. They used passages like that to prove that God condoned slavery. In fact, if you look hard enough, you can generally find a Bible verse taken out of context that will justify almost anything you want to do, whether it be to have multiple wives or commit genocide. In addition, there are many issues that we currently face that are not mentioned in the Bible. It never explicitly states how we should respond to things like climate change, what we should do about nuclear weapons, and whether torture is justifiable during wartime. For guidance on issues like these and others, we can't find just a verse or two that specifically tells us what to do. However, when we read the Bible as a whole, everything in here, we see God's love for all of creation, and we can gain a lot of insight. No, there aren't hard and fast rules about what we should do in every situation. God gave us minds for that. But the Bible does offer guidance on how God would like us to live. The Bible is filled from beginning to end with God's love and mercy. Thus, I don't think we can go wrong if we do things that show love and mercy. And then of course, we living in the 21st century 
have the ability to read the Gospels and find out about the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ, God incarnate, who walked among us. Jesus' life and teachings give us a lot of guidance. The Gospels tell us how he lived a life of love and service to others, a life that lifted up the downcast, included the outcast, and recognized the innate worth of everyone. You see, what God wants most for us is to be in relationship with us. That's why God became incarnate, to show us that there is a relationship that is offered to us by the divine. And the Bible is here to help us with this, because through the Bible, we get to know God. We get to know ourselves better, and we begin to understand the relationship that people can have with the divine. While this book is comprised of many books, I am always amazed at how understandable and coherent it is that all these books written over such a long period of time can tell one story, the story of God and God's relationship to human beings is miraculous. The Bible consistently tells us that God loves creation and cares about everything in it. Now, we also learn that God wants a relationship with us by reading this book. And God will go to great lengths to have that relationship, including becoming human and suffering at the hands who opposed God's way of love. However, God loves us enough to give us freedom, the freedom to say no to that relationship. We have the freedom to choose to refuse God and God's ways and do whatever it is we want. And so the Bible is also full of stories on how those choices result in bad outcomes when we go do our own thing. But the Bible also testifies that God never, ever gives up on us, no matter what we do or don't do. Now, I know I've talked a lot about how the Bible is not reliable as a science book, a history book, or a rule book. But my friends, this Bible is reliable. It's a reliable story of God and God's work in the world. The story of humankind and the story of God's relationship with humankind. It shows us that we can be better people than we tend to be on our own. It is the way we learn about God, but most importantly, when we spend time in the Bible, we are able to encounter the living God. One of the unique things about the Bible is that it is a living word that changes as we read and reread it. As we grow in faith, things that we don't understand the first time we read it make sense later on. Or things that we need to hear from God come to the fore as we read it. Our understanding of the Bible grows as we grow in relationship with God. And thankfully, the Holy Spirit is always there guiding and helping us meet God, understand God's nature, and live in a way that is pleasing to God. All those things are in the Bible, and we can be thankful for that. And that is something that we can rely on. Thanks be to God.